Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. Former Congressman Ron Paul joins us today. Congressman Paul, who has been my intellectual and ideological mentor for all the many years uh, of our friendship, is the gold standard uh, in American modern political history for limited government, maximum individual liberty, economic prosperity, and peace. And in his 24 years in the House of Representatives, he was the greatest defender of the Constitution in the modern era. Today, he runs the Ron Paul Institute, and he lectures all over the country. Congressman Paul, what a pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming back to the show. Judge, it's great to be back with you. We haven't done this for a while. I know, and we must do it more frequently, whether it's you here or me on your show, if I can be uh, so bold. Um, was what happened in Israel uh, two weekends ago uh, when Hamas uh, staged its savage attack, Israel's 9-11? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, we may have had a little a break in the communication. Was what happened uh, in Israel with Hamas's attack uh, 10 days ago, is it fairly characterized as Israel's 9-11? Well, I think in some ways it is, but I think it's difficult to, you know, mimic everything that uh, came about in 9-11, but there are certain, certain things that you can compare them to. I think the reaction is one thing that you can compare it to, how, how people react. Is it an excuse to go and do more harm, or is it as an excuse to seek out the truth? The one thing <laughs> and I'm sure you remember the judge, judge uh, when uh, I was doing the uh, national campaign, uh, that, that subject came up and I said, well, you forgot about one thing, about uh, checking and learning something from 9-11. What, what were their motives? Why, why did they do it? And uh, somebody said, oh, that's off limits. You're not allowed to ask that. And I said, well, every... But every time there's a murder or a killing, they get suspects. And then they then they have to know. Then they have to know what is the what is the motive, what is the excuse uh, before they can go very far. And uh, I think in foreign policy we don't do that. We didn't do that from 9/11. And I think in that way we're doing something very similar. Uh, you know, you know what what is going on in uh, uh, in Israel right now in Gaza. Uh, they're not really asking, and you know, uh, I got I got uh, you, you know strongly criticized by uh, a host on Fox one time, somebody that you knew uh, very well, and I said I brought up the subject. He was after me because I was weak on uh, wanting to uh, be very aggressive, you know, against Iran, and uh, I, I said what. Uh, I said, do you know how, what happened in 1953? He said, I don't want to hear anything about history. You know, it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with it. Well, I'm the opposite. I want to, I want to know the background, the history, the motivation, because if you're going to sol solve the problem, it's sort of like asking the doctor to treat the symptoms without trying to understand what the disease is all about. You, uh, you wrote a recent piece which uh, attracted the attention of a lot of people uh, posted at the Ron Paul Institute website, uh, antiwar.com and uh, our friend Lou Rockwell.com uh, called Hamas's victory. Can you explain how Hamas has, in your view, achieved in some respect a victory already? What was it trying to accomplish by this savage attack? Well, I, I don't know what what they were doing it on purpose, but what happened is stirred up a lot of a lot of animosity. It didn't settle anything. It got more people to uh, join in and become more violent. And whose side you're on? People to spend more money, and uh, they 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 worked very hard uh, to ac accomplish that. And of course, uh, they uh, they were looking. Uh, for, for the chaos is coming, and and I think they did achieve that. They didn't achieve the military victory for the Palestinians, but uh, they achieved a, a victory in the sense that there's been, uh, to me, a, a bit of a surprise how much animosity has spurred, you know, you know has you know appeared now 
uh, we've always known of the indecency of the uh, anti-Semitic attitude, but uh, most of the time it's been sort of held a little bit quiet. But I am uh, I'm amazed how how that has has changed. And if some of the people wanted that, they would might might just call that a victory because uh, they're, they're enemies. The Palestinians and, and the Israelis are enemies. So uh, there's a lot of people now sort of joining in and saying. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it's part of this thing. Maybe more people are looking at the original causes, you know, of uh, what the animosity is all about, and that's that. I think is one was one of their goals, and uh, unfortunately, I think they've achieved uh, achieved it, which will not be a positive on the long run, other than the fact that people might understand how we get drawn into some of this, and w that's to me the most important thing is if you find out that. Uh, country A is doing such and such, and they're at fault. Well, what did we do? Oh, we give them money. We do all these things for the various countries that are fighting these wars, and uh, then we say, yeah, but uh, we don't we don't bring body backs anymore. So we're not morally responsible. We're not responsible mm -hmm. to the Constitution, and therefore we have to just stir up the uh, stir up all the animosity and get more enemies uh, fighting on our side against our our enemies. You're, you're reminding me of uh, comments made recently by Senator uh, Mitt Romney, Republican of Utah, and Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democrat uh, of um, Connecticut. It's amazing how uh, these people that, that uh, agree on nothing agree on war. Uh, both said the same thing. This is the greatest defense spending we have. We're killing Russians, and they're not killing Americans. I guess they forgot about all the Ukrainians being killed. I want to ask you about foreign aid, but before I do, I would like you uh, and the audience to look at a clip of you on the floor of the House of Representatives arguing against foreign aid to Israel. I rise in opposition to this resolution, uh, not because uh, I am taking sides and, and picking who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, but... I'm looking at this more from the angle of being a uh, United States citizen, an American, and I think resolutions like this uh, really do us great harm. Uh, in many ways, what's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides uh, in, in a way because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds especially, essentially are being used uh, for this. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have election, then Hamas becomes dominant, so we have to kill them. There's too much blowback. There's a lot of reasons why we should oppose this resolution. It is not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of Israel either. Eloquent as always and prescient uh, as uh, has often been uh, the case with you. Uh, what is the problem with foreign aid, aside from the fact that it's not authorized by the Constitution, which the Congress doesn't care about, as we know? Well, there's a lot of reasons. The Constitution is one. There is no authority for it. That should be enough. But with right. the lack of respect to the Constitution, it's not a surprise. Well, we don't follow that. That's what I was told once when I was trying to tell them, if you want to go to war with Iraq, you got to have a declaration of war. And I was instructed by the chairman, we don't, we, we don't do that. that. That part of the Constitution is anachronistic. Well, that, that, that is the case. So we want, uh, we want to have the people you know, pay attention to to what's going on. And uh, I, I, what was that? What was the second half of your question? I'm sorry. Uh, sure, John. sure. What 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 harm comes about oh. by all this foreign aid? 
Yeah, you, you know, it's and, and and I got off on a tangent on the Constitution, which I generally do, and it's the um, a moral issue as well. But there's a there's an economic issue too, and the moral issue is not what we might do to foreigners and killing people and stirring up war, but what where does the money come from? Well, we have to steal it from somebody because we don't have there's no money in the bank, so we have to steal the money. So uh, well, we have income tax, but that's not enough. I mean, we have an empire to finance, so we have to, we have to get a lot more money, and that's why we had to become the manager of the uh, world reserve currency after World War II and get hold of that to build our empire. So we we don't have any need to to worry about uh, you know collecting all the money we need. We just print the money. And uh, the system has just uh, unfortunately been beneficial to those who endorse that idea, but eventually it leads to it leads to chaos. But even this whole thing of saying, well, this is an easy way, we don't raise taxes, that and these things, but it is. Inflation is a tax. The tax, unfortunately, is passed on to the poor people the most, the middle class. And what's evident today? I mean, the middle class is getting wiped out. And uh, it distorts uh, it distorts the whole economic system. That in itself is a moral issue, the moral issue of where this money goes. And then it, one thing leads to another. And then uh, it leads to the authority to put on sanctions. Right now we're arguing about, should we give any money back to the Iranians that we stole from them? And, uh, and if you say, yeah, give it back to them, it's theirs, let them deal with it and let us get out of there, you know, that's blasphemy. That, that can get you into political trouble. But one thing I wondered is why they, why they allowed me to stay in Congress, Judge, after all that time. <laughs> I thought, I thought I'd, you know, I, I, I went with the expectation that I wouldn't go get there because they wouldn't vote for my policy. Then I said, if they can know how I'm going to vote, I'm surely not going to have it. So I I didn't give my my uh, uh, district enough credit to think that they would uh, think these things through and actually not uh, try to uh, get rid of me immediately. So I got to stay a couple of years. Well, you were there. You were there for 24 years, and and much of that time uh, was spent as a thorn in the side of the of the pro war, pro big government, pro welfare, pro warfare, pro. In military industrial complex, uh, big party, which is ninety percent of your colleagues in both houses and uh, in both parties. I mean, you and I collaborated on a lot of uh, public events in those days, and you were one of the few. Uh, this is before your son was in the Senate and Thomas Massey was in the House. Uh, one of the few willing to point these things out. I mean, take for example, foreign aid. You alluded to this uh, earlier. We provide foreign aid not only to Israel, but to Israel's enemies. <laughs> so we're, we're effectively funding both sides of these no-win wars, just like we're funding the war in Ukraine, which without our funding, the country will collapse. We not only fund the war, we fund the government, we operate the health system, we operate, we pay for veterans' uh, benefits, we pay for the salaries of the President Zelensky's corrupt employees. And when you argue against this, just like you argued against stealing the six billion that belongs to Iran because it was in a bank that would listen to us, you are considered blasphemous or traitorous or un-American rather than being considered as someone who wants to, as Jefferson said, pain the constant chain the government down to the constitution you know, i don't know the, i mean the, okay. the 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 latest package here i want your opinion on this that president biden is offering is 28 billion dollars now listen to this it's packaged as one bill it's aid to ukraine israel taiwan border wall Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, border wall. So there's something in there for everybody in an effort to borrow $28 billion from the Chinese and then print the cash uh, to pay the interest on it. 
you know, that, that's a mess, and that's, uh, they can do things like that because they don't start with a moral principle of, uh, you know, what is right and what is wrong. So whatever you can get away with is it. And if the, pro if the uh, big money and the special interests uh, make a lot of profit, that, that doesn't bother them e either. Uh, but the, uh, the whole thing about the, the, Ukraine, <laughs> the Ukrainians, they, they, uh, they get this money from us and uh, we have to borrow it from somebody else to give it to the Ukrainians. It's, it's, a, it's almost insane. You know, it's, it's so, so foolish that uh, people put up with this. But I think what, what they do is if they, uh, if they can tide it over they have short memories. If I can just get my food stamps for tomorrow, but the food stamps today that they're talking about are the food stamps that they want to add on to the owners of the uh, of the empire. They want their food stamp bank full all the time. So just get it passed and make it any any excuse whatsoever. And so they approach it from a different viewpoint than I know you will and that I will, that uh, you have to start with a moral principle. You know, the, uh, and I love the way, uh, uh, Judge, that you've always said, always emphasized a higher natural law, because without this, you know, they, they, they have no beliefs. And it's real, it's difficult when they find this excuse that they don't have to explain it by a moral principle, then uh, it's who's the most aggressive, who's the most powerful, who's the most greedy. And it ends up with a bad world scene. And that's been there, of course, for thousands, thousands of years, that principle. But there are times when people recognize it. And the one thing, the more they recognize this whole principle of natural law, the more likely there will be peace and prosperity in those areas that endorse those principles. Well, the government, of course, hates the natural law because the government thinks that it is the source of our rights rather than our humanity being the source of our rights. But here's uh, President Biden manifesting no principle whatsoever, arguing on 60 Minutes that we can fight two wars at once. Cut three, Chris. His only principle is power. Are the wars in Israel and Ukraine more than the United States can take on at the no, same time? We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The most powerful nation in the history, not in the world, in the history of the world. The history of the world. We can take care of both of these and still maintain our overall international defense. He forgot that the last war we won was World War II. I don't know what he's talking about, the most powerful country in the world. Vietnam, disaster, defeat. Afghanistan, disaster, defeat. Iraq, disaster, defeat. Cost trillions in dollars and millions in lives lost. I'll let you take it from there. You worked with this guy, I think, when you were in the <laughs> House and he was in the Senate. Yeah, you know, while I was listening to uh, Biden, this, this whole thing, uh, who's the most powerful and most wonderful, and we are the powerhouse, we're at the epitome of our, uh, of our empire. Of course, uh, you know, I, I work on the assumption if they don't develop decent, re decent, reasonable moral law, the, the empire ends. And I think that's a sign that maybe today that we're seeing that happening. But he said that they're the, we're the most powerful ever. I happen to think ideas are the most powerful, and I, and I like I love the state statement that ideas have consequences. Good ideas have good consequences, and good ideas cannot be stopped even by armies. And that's why uh, I think you stick to your guns and you keep finding ways to spread this message. And it gives me motivation to do it, understanding that I don't have to learn how to shoot guns. <laughs> you know, when, when I was thinking about medical school, one of the things, you no, know, when I was thinking about my education, I thought, uh, well, one thing is, because I remember World War II and all the other wars, that I, I, I didn't want to, I, I couldn't shoot and kill people. So I didn't want to. I said, and I know I'm going to be drafted and I'm going to go into the med medical care and that, that I think I can survive with, you know, being able to take care of somebody. But that's uh, people don't realize the benefits and the uh, ability to ideas to spread. And 
you never have to worry about how it happened. You know, the founders use the, you know, pamphlets. And today we have other ways. Some of us get on radio and television and, and other things, but the message has ch changed. And even, even uh, I think it was great the way the people in America basically, in a large number, got sick and tired of lockdown, you know, with COVID. You know, the, right. they, finally the, the parents of kids and others went to board meetings, uh, school board, and that's the attack on the uh, educational system is still there, but we still have a lot of problems. <laughs> but, uh, and to me, I think that's why you have to work in the area of ideas, thinking that is a, and I don't like to use power, I like to say, influence. I don't want power, but I wouldn't mind saying, well, you've had a lot of influence in a positive way. That would be nice to be heard. But uh, no, they, they say uh, that, no, we have to be powerful and we have to have more nukes than they have. That sort of is not my thing to talk about. Congressman Paul, as feisty, as influential, and as filled with ideas as ever. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope we can do it again soon. Great to be with you, Judge. Of course, of course. Thank you, uh, my dear friend and mentor over all these years. Coming up uh, later today, uh, Matthew Ho at 2 o'clock Eastern. How difficult will it be for the Israeli army once they enter Gaza and engage in something for which they've never been trained called guerrilla warfare? And at 4 o'clock this afternoon, Scott Ritter himself. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.